Now, if I wrote a list of what you're looking for, are any of these items, issues, or things on it? I'm not living my best life yet. Problems with being myself, changing behaviors that are less than. Am I really headed in the right direction? Jesus said this, recorded in Luke 9, 23. He then looked everyone in the eye and said to them, Joining me in close companionship in your daily walk involves perceiving my mission as fully representing you. Get over and done with any idea of self that contradicts your true I am-ness. Here is how you do it. Truth markers. Get out your Sharpie. And what does truth accomplish? Freedom, change, restoration. Let me ask you this in the light that I'm sharing from a mystical view. Well, 34 years of learning to see in the spirit, an author which gives you a map of my personal journey, and I've been sharing those aha moments with the body of believers since 2010. Ah, that's my pastoral hat. Encouragement is worth finding, especially if their story tells you how to get there. Well, you know my passions. Come on, let's go. And a little hint, make sure you stay for the outro. Hello from the Pacific Northwest. This is Kristen from KristenWombach.com, and you're listening to Intentional Now Podcast. Answer me this. How does a Baptist farm girl from Oregon stumble upon the mystical nature of Christ, the love of God? If you're like me, Jesus has redefined what you used to say yes to. Join me and my guest on a mystical journey but before we talk about the spiritual woo-woo, you need to know I am totally sold out to Jesus. It's amazing what the love of God reveals. Good afternoon and welcome. First and foremost, I'd like to say you have got this. You got it. No, really. You have got this. Today, we're going to learn, tell, point, direct, which way we are going. Anybody need a really good road sign from Jesus? Yes. Pointing this way. So traffic signs you want to follow pointing you to you are here, right? Well, that's why I titled it Recycle into a Productive Mindset. Productive Mindset? Well, what you think about, the thoughts that churn over and over again, do they point the way your destiny or do they point in a circle that regurgitates the same cycle again and again? Let me start with our very first marker of truth. It was a truth I encountered many years ago, and no one believed me. When I say no one believed me, well, I believed me, and I certainly believed him. I share with you in the unfinished book. And when I say, you got this, I mean you got this. So let me grab my book here. I am reading from page 39 in the unfinished book, and it's titled, And It Came to Pass. Holy Spirit and I were enjoying discovering each other. Renewal days, you know? I was outside of the normal hub. A full-time mom with one boy in diapers, another in pull-ups, and the two 
oldest running full steam ahead on our small farm. Don wasn't mm, an expert in this Holy Spirit stuff either. And I made him roll his eyes more than a time or two. The story begins with me getting dinner on the table for the Wombat Clan. Don had just arrived home from a tiring day at the shop. I've had another off the charts encounter and I was bursting to share about the crazy like I was really their dream. A good friend of ours from church bravely joined us at our active and boisterous meal. You know how the room gets quiet when their mouths are full. Oh yeah, it's a perfect time to burst open with the daily secrets revealed from Jesus' heart. So I bravely shared last night's happenings to the lifelike vision. It was so real. The Lord showed me a little girl crossing the street after school and she stepped out onto a busy afternoon street not using the crosswalk and a white car collided with her leaving her unconscious under its bumper. I saw myself witnessing the accident jumping out of my car and running over and laying hands on her and praying for her recovery and she lived. The dream hit deaf ears and rolling eyes when I shared it. It's like, can you imagine? Uh Uh-huh. And like so many other happenings, I began to bottle up those experiences. I mean, you can't really tell your experience if people are going to roll their eyes at you all the time. I so desperately wanted to share. Well... Three months later to the date after the vision, I had just picked up two of our big boys from school. We were rounding the blocks heading to visit Dad at the shop, and it happened. The little girl was hit just like in the dream. I instructed my boys to stay in the car. I leaped out, heart pounding, and I laid my hands on her unconscious body. People were yelling and calling for help, and I didn't leave, praying loudly without fear or thought of my surroundings. It began to pour, what you might say, raining cats and dogs. I remained constant until she regained consciousness. The paramedics arrived and took her to the hospital, and I am left drenched my body quivering from his power, and I began to notice a few staring eyes through my tears mixed with the rain, and it came to pass. Now that we have shared a story with a little impossibilities, I'd like to share with you a profound encounter that I had with the Lord a couple weeks back. Yeah, I've been hanging on to it and chewing it. I consider the encounter as a mark of truth that is resonating through the life application of you got this. So there's truth there and it's it's like shaking and vibrating and saying you got this. We're recycling our mindsets to produce and unlock blueprints of our original design. Blueprints the whole, the authentic you, the authentic me. Would you join me in a quick prayer? Father, (laughs) I trade out my good, my bad, and my ugly to you. Listener, you trade out your good, bad, and ugly. You give it to God. Now, 
where even the Stevens, right? Heart to heart? Good. So we're encountering blueprints that release wisdoms and understandings we need in our life especially if issues feel consuming. You know, issues can can feel consuming. So we're going to address what feels consuming. We're going to recycle it so you can confidently point and tell yourself, um, nope, we're going this way. So sit back and relax. Grab a glass of wine or your favorite snack. Maybe you're driving safely to work. Just listen. I'll do my best to tell the story. The story is for you. But something I need you to do is put on your heavenly imagination to help Holy Spirit draw a picture in your thoughts. And that picture, Holy Spirit, will illuminate personally for you. This is my encounter. I was parked in the driveway of the home of my first love. Working remotely, the day was warm. You could hear the river at the end of the property, moving the spring rain along the banks of the farmer field and the filbert orchard. The driver's door was open on my car, and I was standing just next to the car with an open laptop in my hands. God has used the metaphor of my first love so many times throughout the years. It brings such a fondness to me. I just, it's like, oh, there he is again. Can you remember your first love? Nothing like that giddy passion that your heart is entwined with. There's so much more to that story of my first love, but that redeeming story, ah, you're going to have to wait till my next book is finished. So I was standing there with my laptop in hand, and I was working remotely, and a good-looking businessman, entrepreneur, he approached me. Hence, in dream language, God approached me, and God is on the premises. He said he had an opportunity for me that will make it easier. He then asked me to tell him my salvation story using a context of French toast. That's odd. But I'm a good storyteller, and I know my own story. I could do that. So I began to tell God, this good-looking entrepreneur, the story, my story. That's what he asked for, our story. And the words just unfolded effortlessly. I saw myself as if I was the original writer of John 1. You know? In the beginning was the Word. It already existed. The Word was with God, and the Word was God. Yeah. My simple stories sound just like this. I existed with you in the beginning. I was with you and the Word, and we were all together. And there was life on the earth, and we sat down together to enjoy a breakfast of French toast. We sat at this darling round table, and it was covered with a white tablecloth printed with the tiniest of rosebuds. The chairs, they were wheat back chairs, were white. It was a perfectly appointed table setting the French toast, and it was melting in your mouth, leaving a hint of cinnamon, vanilla, and maple syrup. Ah, just lick it off your lips. And that is the way it has always been, from the beginning till now, until forever now. Our day always starts this way. We sit down together and eat breakfast of French toast. End of encounter. But his presence just lingered.
just like the cinnamon, the vanilla, the maple syrup on my lips, it just lingered. I woke up in awe and with a bajillion questions, French toast. <laughs> okay, the lingering feeling of encountering a truth that will illuminate life, set free, empower grace. Oh. So I didn't rush and I stayed connected to his lingering present, tasting and seeing and knowing his goodness. Yeah, just hush, sit there. It's a good spot. So my honey came in my office, gave me a kiss on his way out the door. I fed Dash, sat down at my desk, poured my first cup of coffee, and I opened up Google. <sighs> French toast. <laughs> now the story gets good. Okay, can we think here? Yeah. So, this is what I found. The actual term for French toast goes back to about the 17th century England. Early settlers brought the term and the recipe with them to America, which has continued to spread in popularity. Yep. To this day in France, they call it pain perdue, which means lost bread. This was because people originally made French toast from stale bread as a final use before throwing it away. Huh. Pain Perdue. And it's pronounced pan perdu, I think. It literally means lost bread. And it refers to this dish's magical ability to rescue stale bread that would otherwise be lost. Huh. Talk about recycling our productive mindset. Well, that's the entire gospel story. Dipped in egg with a little cinnamon and vanilla. Pain Purdue. Literally. Lost bread. So I could hear my story, our story, and I told it and we ate it before the was was. Through every age, from age to age, we have communion with the word. We have communion with ourselves. We have communion not with our pain that represents Jesus nailed on the cross. No, we have communion with our true Genesis, our true self, because he nailed our lost self on the cross. And today we're going to remind ourselves where exactly our old self resides in his death, nailed to the cross. That's where it belongs. Now, I am no different than you. We have different likes and dislikes, but each one of us reflects a beautiful facet of him. When I talk about the oneness of the gospel. Are you listening? Yeah, yeah, yeah. When I talk about the oneness of the gospel, I'm talking about you and me and the same frequency and sound of his lingering presence that I encounter. It's now vibrating the words of this story. The words themselves, when I talk about the story, it opens the door. It's no different than the dream I had, which came to pass and saved a little girl's life. Take a moment to feel his presence. And if you happen to enjoy French toast, imagine a sharing breakfast together. <laughs> In the core of my being, as I sit here in the Pacific Northwest with my headphones on, a microphone speaking to you, I believe our oneness is similar, like a heavenly radio. 
we tune into different stations at different points in our life. But the truth is, the voice on the radio and all the stations has always been powered on. When we come into relationship, even for the briefest of moments, our core sound is lifted and his sound of our original, your original you, my original me, it's released in each of us. I choose to believe that the channel knob is tuned into your perfect originality. Now, freedom and breakthrough. That's what I'm choosing to believe right now. We know the story of the woman with the issue of blood found in Luke 8, right? Mm -hmm. She was so focused on touching the hem of his garment. And that faith action released healing into her body. Jesus even mentioned by her action that he felt the unction, he felt that healing virtue leave himself. So let me share with you the same story and how I hear it from her perspective. Like if we were going to ask her, the woman of the issue bread, tell us the story. Why is she so focused on touching the hem of his garment? According to Levitical laws at that time, a woman was unclean at any time that she menstruated, whether monthly, having a baby, or in the case of sickness. This passage is found in Leviticus 15. It says in verse 25, if a woman has a flow of blood for many days that is unrelated to her menstrual period, or if blood continues beyond the normal period, she is ceremonially unclean. What did uncleanness do? Think about it. It's separated. Is there anything in your life that makes you feel separated? In short, she, the woman with the issue of blood, was permanently banned from her family. Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah, they had tents for women at that time. So, but can you imagine being separated from your family for 12 years? Maybe you can. Maybe a situation or circumstances has created an issue of blood in the area of relationships. So if we were sitting in the same room with her, I believe she would tell us the reason why the woman with the issue of blood, why her focus was aimed at the hem of Jesus' garment. It's because of what the blue tassels on the garment represented. Mm -hmm. Numbers 15.37 And the Lord said to Moses, Speak to the people of Israel and tell them to make tassels on the corners of their garments throughout their generations and put a cord of blue on the tassels on each corner. And it shall be as a tassel for you to look and remember all the commandments of the Lord and do them. Well, from my perspective, God's law had separated her from her family because she was ill. Imagine her pain and weakness and determination and utter exhaustion. Imagine, here she is, Jesus is coming in the crowd, and she's pushing, trying to be invisible through the crowds. And if anybody knew her situation, her shoulder-to-shoulder touch, much like that of a leper, 
she would have been called out. And technically, by her touching Jesus, it made her unclean. But imagine, she reached out for what separated her. The loss separated her. And that's what she reached out for. But she touched the Messiah who declared the law dead. She recycled what was old and void and brought forth the energy and the sound of pure redemption. I think of this story as if she was telling me and how angry you would be that a law could separate me from all the things and the people I love. And she recycled what was old and void. And she brought forth the energy and sound of pure redemption. Recycling. Have you looked up that word lately? Recycling is the process of converting waste materials into new materials and objects. <laughs> the concept often includes the recovery of energy from waste materials, and the recyclability of a material depends on its ability to reacquire the properties. It had in its original state. She recovered the energy and the goodness of God as her healer through Jesus Christ. I love her story. <laughs> Let's take a moment. Is there anything in your life that can relate to her? I'm going to pull one word from it. Let's use the word struggle. The word struggle. That's the, that's the word. Yeah. So the definition of struggle is to strive, to labor, in difficulty, to fight for or against, to contend. <laughs> to contend. Can you feel her contending? God has obviously given us a very fragrant and strong metaphor today. Mm -hmm. This tells me that he is compassionate about our life in this matter. This encounter, this lost bread, this pain bread, French toast, pain bread, pan paradou, lost bread, Bread that is stale and day old and forgotten and unusable, but it has the magical ability, its divine persona is to be rescued or recycled converted waste materials to reacquire the properties it had in its original state, our original state. John 1, in the beginning was the Word, and it already existed. The Word was with God, and the Word was God. And we're right there within it. I don't know how that speaks directly to you, but I'm deeply moved. <laughs> what makes it a life application for me? How do we unpack it? When I say a life application, it makes it authentic and real and down home, and it's right there in your kitchen. It applies to my life. And God is recycling my old self that is nailed to the cross, and he brings forth the original Genesis that sits in him Every morning eating French toast. <laughs> Just like John 1. In the beginning, God and we. You can tell that I've chewed on this and chewed on this. So over the course of 
these weeks, this couple weeks, I've meditated on it. The French toast, the pain bread, the lost bread. I've asked and I've re-asked to understand what is hidden in the spirit so that we can extract his goodness into the now. (laughs) I have a few more morsels to share. Thus far, truth has been shared from a dream that saved a little girl's life. It was unbelieved, made fun of, impossible, but true. From an encounter with my first love, and God asks us to tell our story of his redemption. But tell it like this from French Toast, declaring our genesis and experiential right there in him in John 1.1. In the beginning was God, and we were in him. And just like the woman with the issue of the blood, who touched truth, and she changed the law that separated her, the law of I can't, the law of I don't know how, the law of it's too hard, the law that seems to have been laid down in certain areas restricting freedoms. Freedoms that Jesus came to give you and I the pain bread, the lost bread, our story. Just like my encounter of God being dressed as a successful businessman who asked me to tell my story. And remember my story, your story. It was all sewn into the hem of Jesus' garment. Our purpose is to tell ourselves this way. I want to go this way. This is the way that I'm going. And that is our purpose here today. I look at it. It's a signpost of truth. And I'm going this way. (laughs) I love to build expectation. So I have. Two more contexts to add to us. Recycling a productive mindset. Yeah, we're recycling the way that we have been thinking to produce the truth because that's where we're going. Let me share. In Christianity, we speak of carrying your cross. Scripture tells us to deny ourselves, take up our cross, and follow Jesus. Correct? Matthew and Galatians tells us that. Let me share this with you. Luke 9.22. This is from the mirror. The Son of Man is destined to suffer much abuse and cruelty. He will be rejected, then tried, and sentenced to death by the elders, the high priest, and the law professors. And on the third day, he will be awakened to life again. He then looked at everyone. Jesus looked at him in the eye and said to them, Joining me in close companionship is your daily walk. It involves perceiving my mission as fully representing you. Get over and done with any idea of self that contradicts your true I am-ness. Here is how you do it. Lift up your cross once and for all by seeing it mirrored in mine. My cross is your cross. Did you hear it? Did you catch it? Let me read it again. Luke 9, 23. He then looked at everybody in the eye and said to them, Join me in close companionship in your daily walk. That's just like us eating a French toast breakfast, isn't it? It involves 
perceiving my mission as fully representing you. Get over and done with any idea of self that contradicts your true I amness. Here is how you do it. Lift up your cross once and for all. Once and for all. It didn't say daily, daily, daily. Nope. It said once and for all by seeing it mirrored in mine. My cross is your cross. My pain bread is his pain bread once and for all. The story of my salvation is the story of his salvation raised, redeemed, done. What was lost is found. My genesis, my original self, your genesis, your original self. And this is the way we're going towards our original self. When I look in the mirror of reflection, I see Jesus showing me, me, me. He's showing you, you, your true I amness. Get a little bit up on my soapbox. <sighs> now for the icing on the cake. And I am so glad that you stayed here to listen. <laughs> this is where it all comes together. It's the good stuff. And I'm sharing this from a very familiar female place. And I trust that in our sameness, yeah, you and I, we speak many of the same language. Been there, done that. <laughs> Worn the same t-shirt somewhere along the journey. And I just feel like God's going to reach across the sound waves from this favorite place, from this thought, because that's what he did for me. And if he did that for me, he does it for you. And it, it, every time it makes me go, oh, God, you are so good. He touches my heart every time. And to think God reminded me of this right here in this spot, in this time, and chewing over these encounter to understand his truth that points the sign to say, yep, you're going the right way. We're going this way. <laughs> so I did a bit of a search and I found out why. He used another metaphor to remind me what heart touches truth that lingers within. <laughs> truth, just like encountering my first love and God dressed like a businessman. He sets a marker that you can't explain away. And the purpose because this is the way we're going. We're going this way to the signs, the markers, the truth. Because this is my original self. <laughs> so grab your Jane Austen Kleenex box. <laughs> you are very familiar with this movie. Let me set it up. <laughs> Sense and Sensibility. It's a movie from 1995, and the film is directed by Ang Lee, and it's based on Jane Austen's 1811 novel of the same name. Emma Thompson wrote the screenplay and also stars as Eleanor Dashwood, and Kate Winslet plays Eleanor's younger sister, Marianne. The story follows the Dashwood sisters, members of a wealthy English family, as they must deal with the circumstances of sudden destitution. They are found, they are forced to seek financial security through marriage. 
we have Hugh Grant and Alan Rickman. They play their prospective suitors. Yep. Raise your hand if you have seen this movie more than five times. <laughs> I raised both hands. If you purchase this movie, I know, I know. That's why I stuck it in the outro. <laughs> See how much we have in common? Yep. So let me set the scene. Remember, God is setting the scene. It's like there's a little hidden aha moment. So the scene is where Marianne has had her heart crushed by Willoughby. Ooh, boo, hiss. And on their way home to Devonshire, Eleanor and Marianne stop for the night at a country estate of the Palmers, who live near Willoughby. So remember, Marianne cannot resist going to see Willoughby's estate and walks a long way in a torrential rain to do so. As a result, she becomes seriously ill and is nursed back to health by Eleanor after being rescued by Colonel Brandon. Mm -hmm. So Marianne recovers and the sisters return home. She has regained a second chance at love. The next scene is of her recovery at Barton Cottage. During her convalescence, Marianne is sitting outdoors and Colonel Brandon is reading to her. You recall the scene, no doubt. We're right there. Colonel Brandon as Alan Rickman in his perfect British dialect he reads to her can you picture it for whatsoever from one place doth fall is with the tide unto another brought for there is nothing lost that may be found if sought now let me read that again for you but God's going to read it. Remember, God is the one who brought it to our attention. For whatsoever from one place doth fall is with the tide unto another brought. For there is nothing lost that may be found if sought. I've heard this many times and been touched by the words in this scene. But why God and why now? Why are you reminding me of this? I tell you. Because God knows those moments when our, our heart is just touched. Mm-hmm. So those particular words are found from the Fairy Queen. It's an epic poem by Edmund Spencer, written 1590, which follows the adventures of the number of medieval knights. The poem is written in deliberately archaic style. It draws on history and myth and patil... I can say that word particularly the legends of Arthur. So each book follows the adventures of a knight who represents a particular virtue, holiness, temperance, chastity, friendship, justice, and courtesy. And who has that quality in him or herself is tested by the plot of the poem, The Fairy Queen. It's an allegorical work in praise of Elizabeth I. Mm -hmm. It's represented in Gloriana, the fairy queen herself, the virgin Belle Phoebe, and the Elizabethan notions of virtue. This particular small saying, yes, that I just mentioned, that God highlighted it to me and thus sharing it with you. For whatsoever from one place doth fall is with the tide unto another brought. For there is nothing lost 
that may be found if sought is found on page 198 in the chapter of justice. This is the way we're going. Justice is the sign we are following. Justice. I love it. <laughs> I love it. And I love it that God shared it from, yeah, our goofy chick flicks. He shares that marker of truth, that road sign that encourages us, that lifts us up and says, yep, you are going the right way. Keep going. Our original self is being seen, is being mirrored in him. God is good. I think I'm going to leave it there. It is always my privilege and pleasure to share with you how God reminds me of his truth. It's, it's a marker. It's, it's a truth that I latch onto and grab on and share with you. Because in our oneness, there is no difference. And together we hold on to them. We are inspired by him for change and restoration. Amen. <laughs> yep, and I already started next week. Oh my goodness. But then again, you're just going to have to show up and I will share my honor and privilege. You have a wonderful rest of your day. And I will talk to you next week. Bye now. <laughs>